assalamu alaikum so in this lecture we'll talk about um, the interpretation of standard deviation so in the previous lecture we discussed how do we calculate standard deviation and what are the factors on which it depends on and we also discussed how do we draw the normal distribution curve so once we have the normal distribution curve um, there are some factors which remain constant in every case when we deal with random errors and we draw the normal distribution curve so whenever we have the normal distribution curve um, on the x-axis if you change the value of residuals with standard deviation so we have zero that means uh, the mean value where you have zero is residual and then you have on the right side one standard deviation two standard deviation and three standard deviation and similarly on the left side you have a negative one to three standard deviation so what this graph tells us that um, between one standard deviation and negative one standard deviation you have values 68.2% per, 68 of the time so 68.2% of the time the value will lie between plus minus one standard deviation similarly if you increase the range the percentage of values in the range will keep on increasing and beyond plus minus three standard deviation the probability that the value will lie there is pretty small so what this graph tells us is that um, we can calculate the probability of errors in a set of data so let's say if I have a data of 10 students um, giving me 10 values for a certain angle. I can calculate standard deviations. And once I have the standard deviations, I can calculate the probability of error. So what is probability that next time a student gives me a value, it will be between a certain range. So I can now assign percentage of probability to different values. And that can give me confidence on the precision of the data that I have. So another way to look at this curve is when you have um, uh, the, the values between plus minus one, plus minus two, and plus minus three standard deviation in terms of percentage combined. So 68.26% of the time, the value should lie between plus minus one standard deviation. 95.46% of the time, which will lie between plus minus two standard deviation and 99.72% of the time, it will lie between plus minus three standard deviation. And it might be hard for you to um, imagine it or to picture it properly, but in the live lecture, we'll talk about different examples, uh, which will help you to understand it uh, in a better way. So these errors, uh, 50, 90, and 95, are commonly used as, um, as values to comment on the accuracy of the data. So what we have calculated is that uh, between plus minus one standard deviation, the percentage of values is 68.26. And between plus minus two, it is 95.46. And plus minus three, it is 99.72. What I'm interested in calculating is what between what range do 50% of the values lie? Between what range do 90% and 95% of the values lie? So I can convert this into that format. So um, from this graph, I can see that between these two ranges, I have 68.26%. And if I want to go for 50%, that would mean that the range would decrease. So that means it won't be plus minus one standard deviation. It would be something smaller than that. Similarly, if I want to do it for 90, it would be somewhere over here, the ranges. And that means it won't be plus minus two standard deviation. It would be something smaller than that. And we can actually see that in the next slide where they have calculated the standard deviations for 50, 90, 95 percent errors. So for 50, we discussed it must be less than plus minus one. It's 0 0.6745. Similarly, for 90, it is 1.6449. And 95, it is 1.9599. 
So the 50% error is called as the most probable error and it establishes the limits within which the observation should fall 50% of the time. In other words, an observation has the same chance of coming within these limits as it has of falling outside of them. So um, when you have this range, so you can give a prediction of 50% probability. And the so-called three sigma error is often used as a criteria for rejecting individual observations from the sets of data. Thus, within a group of observations, any value whose residual exceeds three sigma or three times standard deviation is considered to be a mistake and either a new observation must be taken or the computations based on one less value. So what we would do is that if we have a set of data, let's say I have uh, 10 values, right? And using these 10 values, I calculate the standard deviation and I calculate first, well, first I calculate the residual for all these 10. And then using the residual, I calculate the standard deviation and then I can calculate plus minus three times standard deviation. And then what I would do is I would compare the residual for each of them with the plus minus three standard deviation. And if the residual is greater than this, I would omit that value from the set of data. So if before I had 10 values, now I would be left with nine values. And then using these nine values, again, I would calculate a new standard deviation and use that for the rest of the calculations. Because the, the theory says that if a residual is more than a certain value, then it means that that error is not a random error. That is a probably a personal error or systematic error that has to be eliminated because whatever we're doing, uh, we're doing it for the random errors and not for other types of errors. And random errors don't have a very large value. So the 90 and 95% errors are commonly used to specify precisions required on surveying projects. Of these, 95% error, also frequently called the two sigma error, is most often specified. As an example, a particular project may call for the 95% error to be less than or equal to a certain value for the work to be acceptable. So by using this, we can um, comment or we can pass work for acceptance criteria or acceptance limits. So we don't want the error to be greater than 95%. And it would depend, it would vary from project to project. For some projects in which accuracy of, is of utmost importance, um, you can lower this limit. Uh, for other projects, you can again extend this limit and these can differ based on what project you're working on. The range of values within which the true value should lie for a given probability is required. This range is called as a confidence interval. It's bounds called the confidence limits. A figure of 95% is frequently chosen. So what that means is um, that for any project, you can determine the confidence limits. And then when you keep on taking more readings, you can then um, either accept or reject them based on if they lie within those confidence limits. So error propagation. So what, what we've talked about is that how we can eliminate random errors. And if you don't eliminate them, it means the error would keep on propagating. This is something that we've discussed before as well, that um, commonly when you have values such as areas or volumes that depend on individual measurements. So if your individual measurements have those errors, then you use those measurements in finding something else. It means that the error is propagating. So error is transferring to more and more values. And that means more and more values are now faulty. So that is why it, it's more important that you deal with the random error as early as possible. You see that it's within the limits and then you can use it. Variance is basically standard deviation squared. So if you see the term um, which is there for the variance, this one, this is basically 
if you take the under root with a plus minus, this becomes standard deviation. Standard deviation squared becomes variance. And sometimes um, some theory uses standard deviation, some theory uses variance. Both of them represent the same thing. Um, they give you an idea about the extent of errors in any value or any set of data, um, but they can be represented in different ways. Then we have error of the mean. So if you revise whatever we've done up till now, what we've done is that since we don't know the true value, from a set of readings, we calculate the mean and we call the mean as the most probable value. And then from that most probable value, we subtract individual values to calculate residuals. And then using those residuals, we calculate the standard deviation. Now the problem is that each individual value has some error. And we use those values to calculate the most probable value. So that means the most probable value also has an error. And at the end, you need to account for that. And that error we call as error of the mean. So it says that since the mean is computed from individual observed values, each of which contains an error, the mean is also subject to error. So what we can do is that we can calculate the error of the mean and it is equal to standard deviation divided by under root of the number of values that we have used to calculate that. So more the number of values that you use, the lesser would be the error in the mean. That is why we also say that, always say that the data set has to be bigger. The bigger the data set, the lesser the chances are of an error in the mean. So what is the applications of the probability models that we've studied? So <clears throat> one is that to analyze observations already made for comparison with other results or with specification requirements. So it, um, I can give an example of um, a machine which is used to fill up bottles of Coke, let's say. Now that machine is programmed to fill in, let's say 1.5 liters every time. But due to, you know, um, random errors, it, it's not 1.5 liters every time. It's something more or less than that. And if we conduct an experiment on, let's say, 30 bottles, we see that how much the machine is filling up. Now, the most probable value in this case has to be the true value, which is 1.5 liters. Now, whatever it has filled up 30 times, we can calculate 30 residuals and then we can calculate the standard deviation. Once we have the standard deviation, we can comment on the working of the machine. So we can say that 95% of the time, the machine makes an error of this range. 50% of the time, it makes an error of this range. So we can analyze the observation already made and then we can compare it with um, what the specification requires it to be. That means the specification says that it has to be 1.5 liters, but what it, what is it actually giving us in terms of probability or percentage? <clears throat> and the second application is to establish procedures and specifications in order that the required results will be obtained. So once you have the probabilities, you can make some amends. For example, um, in the same example of Coke, we can reprogram the machine to, let's say, fill in 1.51 liters instead of 1.5 or something lesser than that based on what that machine is doing. Similarly, if I have, uh, if I make two group of students or 10 students each and I tell them to give me a particular reading, I can calculate standard deviation for both the groups and I can see that which group has more precision. It's giving me a better value. And then I can shuffle the two groups so that both the groups give me values within acceptable limits. So once you have this information, once you have this data, 
यू कैन मेक सम चेंजेस और इमेंट्स बाय विच योर एरर कैन रिड्यूस now we come to another concept of weights of observations so what this basically means is that um if i ask five students to give me a particular reading now what i was doing before is that i was treating each student or the ability of each student or the reading of each student as equal so i use the five values i calculate the average um call that the most probable value calculate the residuals and then the standard deviation but if let's say out of that five students i know that um three of them are more experienced than the other two now what i can do is that i can assign more weight to the value that those three are giving me and lesser weight to the value that the two are giving me. so what i can do is uh let's say i give a weight of 2 to those three values and a weight of 1 to the remaining two values now before what i was doing is that in order to calculate the most probable value i was just taking the average but now i would be taking weighted average that means before i was dividing the sum of values by 5 now what i would be doing is i would be multiplying 2 with the summation of three values and i would be multiplying 1 with the summation of the remaining two values and when i divide now i would be dividing by 8 wait multiply by individual value and the summation so this is how the average in this case would be tilted towards the values to which you give more weight so in this sense your end results become more reliable so this is the concept of weights in observations and now let's see a couple of examples which will help us to understand this concept better so mw with this bar is the weighted mean and the sum of individual weights times this corresponding observations divided by the sum of weights so this is what i just explained before and let's see this example suppose four observations of a distance are recorded as these values and given weights of 1 2 2 and 4 determine the weighted mean so in order to calculate the weighted mean what you would do is you would multiply the weights with the individual observations so 482.16 multiplied by 1 plus 482.17 uh, multiplied by 2 42.2 multiplied by 2 and 42.18 multiplied by 4 divided by the sum of weights so now what we have is we have a weighted average which is more tilted towards the values which have more weight otherwise it would be equally Uh, weighted so every value would have the equal input towards the average calculation so another example is that assume observed angles of a certain plane angle triangle and the relative weights so we have a triangle for which we have measured uh, the three angles abc and we say that yeah for for a particular angle i use a better equipment that means that the chances of error in that angle is lesser um, than the other ones so what they've done is they have given the weight 1 equal uh, for the angle a and 2 to the angle b and 3 to the angle c that means that when we calculated the angle c or observed the reading of the angle c uh, we either had the best instrument or we either had the best surveyor so that means that value should be given more importance than the other two values so um what we do is that first we calculate the sum of the angles and we know that it should be equal to 180 but in our case it comes out to be 179 degrees 59 minutes and 56 seconds so that means it's not equal to 180 there's an error 
and usually what we would do is we would calculate the error and divide it equally to the three angles but now since we have the weight we will give um, lesser correction to the angle c and more correction to the angle a and b because they have lesser weights that means when we observe those angles there were more errors so in the second column we write down the weights one two three and then we write down the correction so the correction that we have written down doesn't really have one rule what they've done is that they have given a random correction of 6x to a 3x to b and 2x to c how they've done it they have given a correction of 6x to a and we know that the ratio of weight for a and b is 1 and 2 that means the correction for b should be half than the correction for a that is why we have 3x similarly a and c have a difference of three times that means the correction for c should be equal to one third of the correction for a that is why we have 2x other way to do it is just give a correction of x correction for b would become x by 2 and correction for c would become x by 3 so it doesn't really matter you can do it either way the answer would be the same and the total correction is 11x right and the correction that actually needs to be applied is four seconds since we know that it has to be 180 degrees but it is 179 59 and 56 that means the correction is of four seconds and the total correction that we've calculated is 11x it could be any other value doesn't matter um, but this is how we proceed so x becomes 0 0.36 and that means we add 6 into 0 0.36 in a 3 into 0 0.36 in b and 2 into 0 0.36 in c and the total correction is 4 seconds so when you add it then you take the sum again it now becomes 180 degrees so this is how we distribute corrections to each value based on its weight otherwise we would have divided 4 seconds equally in the three angles which would have been wrong So how can we incorporate weights when we calculate standard deviations? So if you recall the method for standard deviation, we have um, individual residuals and then they're squared divided by n minus one and all that. Um, when we incorporate weights as well, what we can do is, is that in the equation, we can introduce the weight omega. So um, if you introduce omega, that means you have to multiply each residual by its relative weight. And then you can take the summation and divide it by n minus 1. And if you want to calculate standard deviation of an observation of weight any weight, you can in the denominator introduce that weight. And that will give you the standard deviation for a particular weight. So if you have different weights in your observation, then um, you can calculate different standard deviations for weight one, weight two, weight three. And based on which standard deviation you want to calculate, you can input the values into the equation based on that. So that means that more the weight um, for a particular value, or if you imagine that all the values have a particular weight, the standard deviation would decrease. And if all the values have the same weight or single weight, then obviously the standard deviation would increase. So we have these values for angles. And what we need to do is calculate the most probable value. That would be just the average of all of these 10 values. The range, that would be the maximum value minus the minimum value. Standard deviation. So once you have the most probable value, you will calculate 10 residuals. Um, take their square summation divided by 10 minus 1 under root with a plus minus that would be your standard deviation. The standard error of the mean. So remember, we 
uh, we studied the equation for standard error of the mean. Um, that is standard deviation plus minus divided by under root n. So that would give you standard error of the mean. And then you have to calculate 95% confidence limits. So for that, we had this equation. Um, for 95, we have 1.9599 standard deviation with a plus minus. So that would give you the confidence limits. In the next question, we have the length of a baseline was measured using two different EDM instruments A and B under identical conditions with the results given. Determine the relative precision of two instruments and the most probable length of the baseline. <laughs> so in this question, what we have to do is, um, we have a line, a baseline, which is measured by two different EDM instruments. And from the instrument A, we took one, two, three, four, five, six readings. With instrument B, we took one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight readings. And we need to see that which instrument is more precise. Obviously, uh, we have two sets of readings. For each set of readings, we would calculate the standard deviation. And for the set of reading whose standard deviation is smaller, that means that instrument is more precise. Then we have to um, assign weights to both of these um, readings or both of these instruments. And using those weights, we will calculate the most probable length of the baseline using two sets of data. Otherwise, what we've done is for every time we have to calculate most probable length, we use just once one set of data. But now we would use two set of data to do the same thing. So first step is to calculate standard deviation for both the instruments. So for A, standard deviation comes out to be plus minus 5.73. And for B, it comes out to be plus minus 2.56 millimeters. That means the instrument B is more precise and it should be given more weightage when we calculate the most probable value. If we don't work with weights, what we can do is calculate most probable value for A, average for A, average for B, and now we have two values, calculate their average, and that would be the length of the baseline. But since we know the concept of weight, we can determine the relative precision of the two instruments relative to each other. So in the previous question, the weights were given. So in this question of triangle, the weights were given. In the other example as well, the weights were given. But in this case, we have to calculate the weights. So how we would do that? We would do that by using the standard deviations for A and standard deviation for B. So once we have the standard deviation for A and B, we can calculate the standard error of the mean for A and standard error of the mean for B by just dividing the standard deviations by the <coughs> number of readings. So we had six readings for A and eight readings for B. Now that we have the standard error of the mean, we can use this equation where we have the weight of A divided by the weight of B is equal to the standard error of the mean for b squared divided by the standard error of mean for a squared. So once we do that, we have uh, omega a over omega b. That is weight of a divided by weight of b is equal to 1 over 6.6. That means weight of a is equal to whatever the weight of b is divided by 6.6. Now what we've done is that instead of finding out k weight of A is this much and weight of B is this much, what we've done is we have calculated the relative weight of the two. So we're saying that weight of A is equal to the weight of B divided by 6.6. .6. So how can we use this? We can use this in, uh, in the sense that we have relative weights. So what we want to do is we want to have um, the weight of A multiply by the average length uh, calculated by the instrument A plus weight of B multiply by the average length calculated by the instrument B divided by the sum of weights, something that we've done before in this problem, exactly same thing. 
but since we don't have the individual weights but we only have the relative weights so what we would do is we would replace omega a by omega b over 6.6 .6 and omega b would remain as it is so in the end omega b cancels out in the numerator and the denominator so essentially we don't even have to calculate individual weights just having the relative weights give us the um, final value and we can also apply this concept for any set of readings that we have so instead of a and b even if we had c and d as well so if we had um, another instrument c and another instrument d and their readings as well so what we could do is we could apply the exactly same principle so as of now we calculated the relative weights for a and b in terms of b so in the other cases what we could have done is that we have could have calculated the weight of c in terms of the weight of b either divided by something or multiplied by something similarly weight of b d in terms of the weight of b and then use the same equation that we used in the end so even if you have more instruments in addition to these two more sets of data you can still apply the same principle and it would hold so in the last question uh, you are given angle values and their weights asking you to calculate the most probable value of the angle so in, in our case since we have the weights given we will calculate the weighted mean and that would be our most probable value so this into one plus this into three plus this into one um, the summation divided by the sum of weights and then they're asking you to calculate standard deviation of an observation of unit weight so you would use the equation that we saw in the slide a few slides earlier so um, the individual uh, residuals squared multiplied by the weights summation divided by n minus one and when you calculate standard deviation of an observation of weight three so in the denominator you have this three weight in the denominator and that would give you standard deviation of an observation of weight three and you see that standard deviation decreases when you have a standard deviation of weight one so what this means is that what would be standard deviation if you have the values of weight three only or if you keep on increasing the weight standard deviation would keep on decreasing so this is how you can emphasize on the importance of weights so more the weight lesser will be the standard deviation so this is the end of the lecture and in the class um, you can ask the questions any confusions that you have and we'll continue from there thank you